step of finding who that, that permanent person will be. So as we begin our sermon for this morning, I want to invite you to imagine with me that a spy has been trusted to protect a top secret set of computer files. And to do her job, she needs a password that will let her access the files without the possibility of someone who shouldn't see those files getting their hands on them. In the summer of 2012, a researcher over at Stanford University by the name of Bajanov actually told Time Magazine that he and his colleagues had researched and figured out the perfect solution to this imaginary problem, a password that a spy could theoretically learn without knowing that they had learned it, and any time that they needed it, it would pop back into their mind without them realizing it. Researcher Bajanov had figured out a way to make someone learn something with their unconscious mind that their conscious mind would never be able to share. Now to do this, they created a game where each user who participated in their study had to press certain keys on the keyboard in a certain order and at a certain time in order to be successful or to win points. Now the way that they made this game kind of used the same skills that you would use in a game like Guitar Hero or Dance Dance Revolution, if you're familiar with those two games. But essentially, they had thrown these numbers at these users, invited them to click the right letters and numbers in the right order and at the right, right time, and they had secretly embedded within those sets of numbers and letters a password that could crack open the next level of the game. Two weeks later, the researchers not only found that the, re the users within this study had remembered the password without knowing that they had, but that they were also 15, about 15% quicker in recalling that password without even knowing that they knew it. The technique that the Stanford researchers used in order to do this study was something called implicit learning. And the more we learn about implicit learning, we know that it's something that all humans do at all times. It's not something that Bajanov just taught these users to do in this study, but it's actually built into our minds as social beings. Here are four additional things that humans use implicit learning for. The first is actually learning our first language. I don't know about you, but for the most part, when we see young children beginning to babble their first words in their, in their first language, it's not because their parents sat them down at about nine or 10 months and said, okay, I think you're ready to learn some of the grammar of our language and some vocab words. No, it's because they begin mimicking the people around them and they are absorbing the way that the language functions as they interact with other adults. Another thing that we use implicit learning for is captured in professional fishermen. So I was doing a little bit of reading about this, but for a lot of fishermen who are just kind of handed down the profession, there's not a whole lot of talk from their mentor about how to tell when is a good time to expect a lot of fish. A lot of fishermen learn it because they do fishing so often that they begin to just notice that when the sky looks a different way or even the shade of color that the water is, is a different color, they know about how much fish they can expect for that catch. And again, this is simply because they're engaging in a repetitive action over and over again and absorbing information through that experience. A third way is the way we learn how to type. Now, many of you might have been like me where we were forced to go to a class in high school and we did all of the exercises to learn how to type without looking and all that jazz. But I bet, maybe not bet, I anticipate that if I were to ask you to basically recite the central line of, of keys on the keyboard, that you probably wouldn't be able to do it in perfect order. And that's because over time, maybe, maybe some of you can, but that's because over time, we begin to just unconsciously remember where those keys are on the keyboard. Without having to consciously look down, many people just know where the A is, where the S is, where the D is, where the F is. A fourth way that we learn through implicit learning is culture, through the process of what's called acculturation. It's very rare 
for people to learn what it means to be a woman or to be a man or to be someone of Asian descent or a black person or a white person in this country because someone sat them down and let them know all of the rules and patterns of what it means to have that cultural experience. But rather, we learn to express and live out the culture that we embody through implicit learning, through accidentally absorbing the behaviors of others and the beliefs of others through that interaction. So implicit learning, therefore, becomes this human process of learning information without conscious effort or awareness, but rather through repeated exposure to that information in our environment. And the reality that implicit learning is a significant part of our functioning is what this whole sermon series is going to be based on for the next five weeks. In preparation for this sermon series that we're calling Reformed Politics, Aligning with Jesus in a Divided World, I've been opening up scripture and reading it in conversation with a few authors that you're going to hear me and Pastor Rich talk about throughout the series. But one of these authors is writer and theologian Caitlin Chess. One of her specialties is actually this conversation around what it means to be Jesus followers who are intentionally and thoughtfully engaging in politics. And I've been kind of ruminating over her book, The Liturgy of Politics, as I've been preparing for this series. Here's one thing that she said that just truly struck me. We live in light of some gospel or other. The good news that while we suffer from a fundamental problem with the world, salvation is possible if we submit to a new ruler and if we become a part of a new people. Some of us whose lives are shaped by the Christian gospel are also influenced by other gospels. Stories about what's really wrong with the world and the salvific or salvation-related solution to the problem. Caitlin is essentially saying here that we are all products of implicit learning. That we as humans are constantly receiving from our environment information about what the good news is and what the fundamental problems of our society are. And Caitlin says that this isn't avoidable simply because we call ourselves followers of Jesus. We are still human and therefore we are still products of implicit learning. Now my hope is that as you hear me say this, that that's a comfort that I'm lumping myself in right along with you. This isn't something that we grow out of, but it's something that we learn how to be intentional about. And so now that I've told you a little bit of what our sermon series is going to be about, I want to shift and tell you what it's not going to be, because I think that's helpful. I would even imagine some of you might be feeling a little anxious right now, because you're like, okay, why are we talking so explicitly about politics here? So let me hopefully offer you some consolation. This sermon series is not going to support one party over another. Quite simply, we should not put ourselves as your church, as your church leadership, in the position of telling you which party to engage with. That's not our place. That's something that you are perfectly capable of doing yourself. And it's also illegal. We're not supposed to be actively telling you <laughs> what party to engage with just to say, just to let, it, let you know. But also, this is not going to be some recipe, some checklist for how to vote. That also would be an, a step out of how we should serve you. But what it will be is an invitation to continue or to start engaging with politics thoughtfully as a Christian. And the reason why we do extend that invitation, which of course you have the choice to take or not, is because we often find ourselves wondering if we can just engage as Christians in, in the mission work and the evangelism work of what it means to be followers of Jesus. And, and we can just leave the, the democratic stuff, the, the politics stuff over there. But this democratic process that we're invited to, into as American citizens actually functions as an opportunity for us to demonstrate what kind of impact the gospel of Jesus has had on us. Another thing that Caitlin Chess says in her book on page 63 is that 
American Christians have a long legacy of trying to parse out exactly what counts as political so that we can engage with the parts of the world that go untouched by the corrupting influence of politics. But politics color all aspects of our collective life. Disengaging from politics is impossible, and the effort to do it is an abdication of our responsibility as image bearers. So Caitlin is inviting us to accept this invitation as something that is a part of our effort to show the world how God has impacted us from the inside out. But she's also saying that it's impossible to disengage even if we wanted to. We participate in our political climate through not just voting, but through the conversations that we have with the people at work and with our families around the dinner table. We are influencing one another in terms of what we say. And so Caitlin is saying, as much as we do want to perhaps disengage because of how complex it can become and how uncomfortable it can become, she invites us to fight that urge, to make sure that politics have a rightful place in our minds and that we understand it in its rightful place within our mission as Christians. So for today's sermon series, we're going to use the story of the people of Israel and their exodus out of Egypt and their struggle with a golden calf to explore the following main idea. That when we implicitly or accidentally learn to idolize our politics, the remedy is the right worship of God. That when we implicitly or accidentally learn to idolize our politics or put them in the wrong place, accept a new gospel, the remedy is the right worship of God. I've called this sermon Formed by Worship Over Idols. Let's pray and see what the Lord has for us. Lord God, this is a touchy subject. But Lord, I pray that as we engage with it as a community, that, Lord, you would help us to hear you clearly. The Holy Spirit that you have put in all of your followers of Jesus speaks to us. And so, Lord, I pray that as we open the word, that we would receive it as a seed that your spirit can continually water within us, Lord. Help us to know how we should engage as Christians in our political climate in a thoughtful way. And, Lord, as I, as I do this work from the stage this morning, I pray that you would help the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. For, Lord, you are indeed my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we're going to be reading today from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, just that first half of 5, and then 32, chapter 32, 1 through 4. So I would love to hear your voices. You don't have to stand, but I invite you to read with me from the screen. Let's read together. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have any other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow in worship to them and do not serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron replied to them, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings that were on their ears, and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, fashioned it with an engraving tool, 
and made it into an image of a calf. Then they said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord, and the people said, thanks be to God. I pray that it would fill our minds, flow from our mouths, and free our hearts to live as the beloved children of God. So let's explore some historical context here for our scripture. In chapter 20, we are seeing that this is a moment just after God rescues the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt through the work of Moses. God entrusts Moses with the Ten Commandments something that many of us are familiar with. It's a set of 10 laws that set the people of Israel apart from the rest of the ancient Near East around them. And for our scripture today, these 10 commandments command them to do three things. They offer the people of Israel a commandment of remembrance, to remember that God is the one who released you, who freed you from captivity, a commandment of prioritizing, which is to make sure that they would put no other God before God, and a commandment of method, which meant that the way that they worship this this God that they were meeting for the first time through Moses, that it would not look like the way that the rest of the ancient Near East worshiped their gods. Now, one thing that's important to pull out here is that this is also a commandment, this issue of method of protection. Because what God understood about this common practice of idol worship, which we'll talk about more in detail for the rest of the ancient Near East, is that it was easy for them as humans to begin worshiping the created over the God that they were claiming to worship itself. And so God, in saying, you are not going to worship me the, rest, the way that the rest of the world worship me, worships me, is not only an issue of differentiating the people of God, but also of protecting them from the tendency to worship the created over the creator. But then in chapter 32, we see that we're jumping ahead quite a bit in the story. The people of Israel are, they've got the laws, they've got the Ten Commandments, and they're like, okay, cool, you know, this is kind of new. We don't have a bunch of gods now, now we only have one, okay, we can do this. But they get to the foot of Mount Sinai, And Moses goes up to the top of it and leaves Aaron in charge down at the foot. Now, it seems like time has gone for quite a bit. Because when we look at verse 1 of chapter 32, we see that the people say, Come make gods for us, Aaron, who will go before us. Because this Moses guy that you've had us following, this guy who brought us from Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. As you read in between the lines here, you can probably imagine that they're experiencing impatience, anxiety, and maybe even fear. They had just been asked to worship a new God in a new land in a completely different way. One of the things that that I've been learning as I've been reading some scholars and some Old Testament um, commentaries is that this issue of idolatry was not something that was rare, but it was rather the norm in this time period. This was the main way that people knew how to engage with unpredictable and invisible beings. It's to say that there's this physical object that I'm going to put in the, in the God, lowercase g God's place, and that this object will help me to have access to this God that I cannot see and that I cannot control. And so this was not only an issue of familiarity, but an issue of comfort that the people of Israel were being asked to walk away from. The comfort of having some physical object in front of you like a golden calf that you can say, well, if I can see and touch this calf, then that gives me a little bit of an illusion of control over this God that I cannot see and I cannot control. As we look at the people of Israel with that in mind, maybe we start to develop a little bit of compassion for them, that they so quickly asked for Aaron to build an idol. But now I want to take a closer look at Aaron himself, because I have to admit, when I first started reading this part of scripture in, in my teens or so, I looked at Aaron and I was like, wow, that was, it didn't take a whole lot of time for you to give up on what your brother asked you to do. 
You read the scripture and there's just no space in between the people asking him to build an idol and him saying, all right, great, bring in your golden rings and your earrings and we can get you one fired up real quick. No time at all. And so my first reading of Aaron was one of disappointment and criticism. Your brother trusted you with watching over the people of Israel and you reneged that quickly? But as we continue reading this picture of Aaron alongside of some Old Testament scholars and, and things like the cultural background Bible, we start to develop some com compassion for Aaron too. Because as I said before, idolatry was the norm back then. It was not the exception. And so if you are being yelled at by a group of people that you're being asked to take care of, we need you to do the thing that we've always done. It's probably going to feel pretty easy in that moment to revert back to what's familiar to you if you're under that much pressure. But secondly, this is an issue of comfort for a group of people that I think Aaron knew quite well were feeling quite a bit of fear down at the base of this mountain. And so I would imagine that as a new leader who's been trusted with this group of people, who obviously has some compassion for them, maybe him building an idol was his attempt to give them some comfort in the face of this brand new excursion that God was inviting them into. And so as we take a closer and compassionate look as, at both the people of Israel alongside of Aaron, we start to see this working definition of idolatry emerge. That idolatry is the worship of something or someone other than God that is characterized by putting one's faith in that idol to provide some form of salvation and ascribing to that idol the actions that should only be ascribed to God. However, idolatry more often than not is a fear response. In Caitlin's book, she takes this idea of idolatry as a fear response to another level by exploring throughout the whole uh, chapter three, this issue of four American and false gospels, cultural responses to the things that we fear in the world. Now, I want you to bear with me because as I read this chapter, it kind of just felt like I was just in the, out in the middle of the ocean with just a wave after wave knocking me over of conviction. Here's the first gospel that she offers. It's the prosperity gospel, which I think many of us are familiar with. But Caitlin gives us a fresh take on it that's more expansive. She says that this myth or this false gospel makes us believe that God rewards good behavior in the form not only of financial wealth, but also of physical healthy bodies. This is one of the gospels that, that immediately I felt convicted about because I find this in myself where if I'm experiencing a lack of health in my body or a big shift in health in my body, I just got over shingles a couple of months ago. That was a really tough time for me to try and understand was there something that I did to deserve this physical ailment? Or is it just that in a not fully redeemed world, where our bodies have not yet experienced the full healing of God, that they are decaying and that they will experience a lack of health from time to time. But Caitlin says that this is a gospel that we're handed by America, that it's hard for us not to think this way, that just because we're Christians, we should always be healthy and that we should always be wealthy. And here's our second gospel, the patriotic gospel. This is the false belief that the way to solve the problem that they over there are not like us is to hyper-focus on America as the good guys. Some of you may have heard some of this rhetoric in, in news and in social media, but it's this idea that the natural discomfort that we feel by not fully understanding someone who's very different from us, that America hands us this gospel that in order to solve that discomfort, we have to just think of us in a blanket statement of we're always on the right side of history. Which means that it makes it very difficult to have a transparent conversation about holding America accountable for the harm that we do cause. The third gospel, 
security gospel. And this is the false belief that even though the not yet fully redeemed world is not inherently safe, I still believe that I will stay safe and unharmed if I say and do the right things. This one is a tough one. But Caitlin is acknowledging that America essentially says over and over to us this story that if you feel unsafe or if you are in situations of danger, it's because you've brought it on yourself because you have not done the right things and said the right things. But again, the gospel of Jesus gives us a full and true story that can begin with John chapter 14, where Jesus says to his disciples, you will have trouble in this world. And I'm telling you this so that you will not be in a state of fear, but can experience my peace. We are not exempt from the lack of safety that exists in this world. And this gospel of security tells us, though, that we can experience full safety here on this side of God's full redemption, whereas Jesus says, what you have to look forward to is a full and unwavering safety that everyone gets to experience once he is done fully redeeming and healing all of creation. But the fourth gospel is the one of white supremacy. And if you've been with us here at Sanctuary for a while, you know that, that we're no strangers to having honest conversations about the communal sins of oppression that have happened here in this country. But this gospel tells us the false story that our American history of slavery, racism, xenophobia, that that's an issue of the past only. And that there's no reason at all to learn it, no reason to wrestle with it, no reason to repent of it, and no reason to find contextual ways here and now to rectify it. This is telling a false story about time and about the reality that humans are creatures of habit until we intentionally repent from something. But Caitlin says that's not the story that we're often handed. We're handed the story. If it happened in the past, you don't have to think about it. You can just keep moving forward. All of these gospels combine under the umbrella of a fifth. And it's a more subtle gospel. It's this gospel that our politics are the answer to all of our problems in society. And that if we just employ these four gospels that I just mentioned in the right combination, when we do things like vote or we entrust our elected officials to write our laws, all of our problems will be solved. But frankly, I want to be clear, this sermon series isn't meant to be this accusation that if you find yourself thinking these kinds of gospels, that you're just a bad Christian and you don't love God enough. That's not what this is meant to explore. But this series is really an invitation to explore the fact that there are very real things that make us nervous about society. And that this is not a reason to gaslight ourselves into believing that there's nothing to be nervous about. However, this is an invitation to understand our human responses of fear and our seeking out of comfort with these new gospels, these other stories of good news, and to replace them intentionally with the gospel that Jesus constantly invites us into. This is what the people of Israel were wrestling with at the feet of Mount Sinai. They had been given this gospel where God says to them, you are going to be my people and I am going to bless the world through you if you just stick it out with me. But they got nervous. They hadn't had enough time yet to fully understand what that even meant. And not to mention that, but they just got out of a traumatic situation of slavery. And now in this, at this point in human history, we know that brains that are fresh out of a traumatic situation do not do a good job of rationalizing the way that God was expecting them to do. And so these people of Israel were being handed this very fearful situation of something completely new, and so they reverted back to what was comfortable. We often talk about idolatry in this really aggressive and oppressive way, and we use the word sin with this air of disgust. But even if we label idolatry as sin, we need to broaden our definition of what happens underneath the surface, 
and within our hearts with a sin like this. More often than not, the sin of idolatry is a response to the sins of a not yet fully redeemed and unsafe world. It is a reasonable response oftentimes to an unsafe world. And yet God calls us away from it. How are we supposed to do that? Here's something else that Caitlin Chess says. American Gospels are powerful because of their captivating narrative, their comforting beliefs, and the rituals and practices that form them in our lives. While each Gospel has its intentional characteristics, each is also a communal and cultural experience. Friendly, not only is idolatry often a reasonable response to a fearful situation, but it's hard to push back against the tide of a whole community doing one thing and God calling you into another. And so I just want to acknowledge in this first part of the sermon those realities with compassion to first understand what is it that God is asking us to do and to be honest about the fact that it's a pretty fearful thing that God is asking us to do. But that's okay because God equips us to do those things. What I want to offer in the final part of my sermon is a solution that I think God hands us over and over in Scripture, and that is the solution of right worship. N.T. Wright is a New Testament scholar that, that I really enjoy reading, and here's what he says about worship. By the word worship, but the word worship means literally worth ship to accord with to assign true value to something, to recognize and respect it for the true worth that it has. At the center of that worship stands a passage like Isaiah 33, that your eyes will see the king in all his beauty. The Lord is your judge. The Lord is your ruler. The Lord is your king. He will save us. As we, the followers of Jesus, kind of try to figure out how to navigate our political climate, we've acknowledged that we have legitimate reasons to be nervous, but I wonder if, if what may help us is actually intentionally leaning into and spending time appreciating the beauty of God. What this scripture in Isaiah 33 is highlighting is the fact that what makes God beautiful is the kind of king that God is. What makes God beautiful is the kind of judge that God is. What makes God beautiful is the kind of ruler that God is. What makes God beautiful is the fact that God is not one of those lowercase g gods that just exploits humanity because it's funny. That's the way that the ancient Near East understood a lot of their gods. But what makes our God beautiful is that God is a caretaker, is a shepherd, and that God does not exploit, but that God tries to have us experience flourishing in our lives. But if we don't take time to intentionally think about what is it that makes God beautiful, then navigating our political climate while trying to understand the grotesqueness of what has not yet been healed can feel like an impossible task because we don't have anything to contrast it with. This involves the work of putting politics and what we see in our politics in its rightful place alongside of God's beauty. Being a follower of Jesus means resisting the accidental belief that our politics will save us. Politics provide necessary boundaries and opportunities, but our God is the one who saves through the healing of human hearts and the healing of creation. Our politics are meant to protect, but our God is in whom we trust to save. This is something that I think is helpful for us to remember, that God has always been about this project of saving and healing the world through the healing work that he's doing in our hearts. If we go all the way back to Deuteronomy 30 and 6, where God entrusts Moses to, to talk with the people of Israel about this, we see that the scriptures say, the Lord your God will change your heart and the hearts of all your descendants 
so that you will love him with all your heart and soul and so that you may live. This motif of living in the Old Testament was not this individualistic, I get to have a really nice life kind of live, but it was a communal concept of living. What God is saying here is that as he does the work of healing the hearts of the people of Israel and they begin to bless the people and the creation around them, that all of that creation in that community experiences life as a result. This is a God who had in mind a grand project of using us as partners in the healing of the world. And so as we engage with our politics, it's helpful for us to see that as a part of God's beauty. That God isn't someone who's just sitting afar off and looking down at the things that are not yet healed and saying, wow, those are some tough cookies. But God is actually saying to us, I want you to participate in the healing work that I am doing. That is what makes God beautiful. And so as I close, I want to offer three action steps that I believe that if you engage in them, they will help you to do this work of figuring out how do I wrestle with the very reasonable reasons to be afraid and the very understandable desire to lean into idolatry? How do I push back against those things? Here's my first invitation. Spend some time meditating on the question, what do I really believe God is up to in the world? And does that make me want to worship God? Family, I've spent some time thinking about this question myself. It was actually a key part of me coming out of my deconstruction phase in my 20s. And someone offered this question to me, different word, but same element. And what I realized was that the kind of God that I was asking myself to worship at that time was not really a God that made it feel interesting even to worship. At that time, I was thinking of a God who, who launched this world into action and left it to be this, this really dangerous place full of sin. And that at some point in history, I was going to die and then go to this aloof place called heaven and I'll get to experience good things there while people that I've left behind continue to experience bad things here. As you hear that story and picture of God, you may imagine why I had difficulty worshiping and why I wrestled so deeply with this issue of social justice and suffering in the world. But then when I discovered the God that we just got done talking about, the beautiful judge who judges perfectly, but not just perfectly, but redemptively, that heals when he judges. When I started to discover the God who partners with creation to heal and not exploits them to do all the work themselves, I started to think about, wow, this is a God who is deeply relational and incarnational and is worthy of my worship and my sacrifice. The kind of God that we picture when we ask ourselves to worship actually impacts how easy it is for us to worship him. My second invitation is to use worship music as a reminder of who God is and why we should worship. Family, I know that Sunday mornings can be hard and sometimes we come to church and it's like, ooh, I don't know if I have enough in me to get up and really engage. But at minimum, I wanna invite you, when you hear worship music, ask yourself the question, what is this song saying about who God is? What is, what is this song saying about why God is beautiful? Just ask yourself that question as you're listening to worship music. And my hunch is that you'll begin to see worship music come alive for you in a new way. That when we say things like, our God is greater, our God is stronger, our God is higher than any other, you'll begin to ask the question, what is beautiful about that? It's beautiful that I can rely on God to fully redeem all of the things that I'm seeing going wrong in the world that the hope that I have put in God in the future is worth waiting for. Those are beautiful things that we'll begin thinking about as we are singing those lyrics back to God. And finally, I invite you to engage in the practice of Dainu prayer. We just spent the last five weeks in our past sermon series practicing this spiritual practice. And this is, this is a practice that comes from the Passover Seder, from our Jewish cousins, where they spend time just saying line by line by line, these are the kindnesses from God that I am grateful for. 
When we engage in that practice, we begin to find that worship is a natural extension of our gratitude. When we say to God, I am grateful for the way that you showed up in these small ways, it becomes much easier to see the beauty of God in our everyday lives. Let's pray as we close. Lord, I thank you that you have given us a very human picture of the Israelites. And I thank you for that human picture because it helps us to normalize what's hard about being human. A lot of the things that were hard for them are things that are still hard for us. And so, Lord, I pray that as we leave this place with these scriptures in mind from Exodus, that you would help us to feel compassion toward ourselves if we found ourselves thinking in the words of these false American gospels, and that you will continue to do what you faithfully do, which is invite us back toward you. Invite us back toward thoughtful engagement in politics while putting that alongside right worship of you all along. Lord, help us to do this hard work. It is not easy. But I thank you, Lord, that you do not ask us to do it alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.